Hello, I am Jennifer Watkins with the NHSM Protocol and Training Team. Welcome to the 2022 Annual Training for Ventilator Associated Events, or VAE. By the end of this session, you should be able to understand the Ventilator Associated Events Surveillance Algorithm, apply the VAE definitions, and identify resources for VAE surveillance and reporting. So let's get started. I want to start by defining what a ventilator is. A ventilator is defined as a device used to support respiration through the application of positive pressure when delivered through an artificial airway, specifically an oral or nasal endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. Devices that are not considered a ventilator are devices which apply positive pressure to the airway from some external device, such as a face mask or nasal mask. Why should we be doing surveillance of patients receiving mechanical ventilation? Mechanical ventilation is an essential life-saving therapy for patients with respiratory failure and critical illness, but mechanical ventilation is not without risk of complications, such as ventilator-associated pneumonia. And while this is a really important complication, there are other adverse events that can happen to ventilated patients, which can be just as harmful, such as acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, sepsis, pulmonary embolism, barotrauma, and pulmonary edema, among others. In 2011, CDC convened a working group that included members of several stakeholder organizations in order to propose a new approach to surveillance that addressed the limitations of the existing NHSN pneumonia surveillance definitions. Limitations such as subjectivity, lack of sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity, and limited focus. When this surveillance module was being developed, the goal was to have a protocol that was objective and reliable and that had the potential to automate data collection. In 2013, BAE replaced ventilator-associated pneumonia for in-plant surveillance in adult locations because it is important to try to prevent all ventilator-associated adverse events, not just that. The Ventilator Associated Event Module is intended to detect a range of serious adverse events which may be related to mechanical ventilation. Detection of a BAE may be related to an infectious process such as possible VAP, or it may indicate another adverse event is occurring, such as fluid overload, ARDS, or an atelectasis. Many of these complications are potentially preventable. Therefore, the information that you gather from the surveillance module can be used to initiate actions in your facility to improve patient outcomes by identifying areas for improvement in the care and management of mechanically ventilated patients that may prevent these adverse events from occurring. Please note that BAE and VAP as defined by the pneumonia protocol are separate events and it is possible to meet the definitions of one, both, or neither. We get a fair amount of questions about this, and it is important to remember that BAE and pneumonia are not synonymous, and PVAP is not the same as VAP. Although with the right combination of criteria, you can identify a possible ventilator-associated pneumonia or PVAP, the VAE protocol is designed to detect more than just VAP. So who is eligible for inclusion in VAE surveillance? You can perform VAE surveillance for inpatients in acute care hospitals, long-term acute care hospitals, and inpatient rehabilitation facilities who are housed in adult locations and who are receiving support with mechanical ventilation. VAE is location-based, not age-based, so pediatric patients housed in adult locations are included in VAE surveillance. However, if this includes young children that are not physiologically similar to the location's adult patients, then you might want to consider using a virtual location for these pediatric patients. Patients that are not eligible for VAE surveillance are those who have not been on mechanical ventilation for at least three days, those who are on high-frequency ventilation 
or paracorporeal membrane oxygenation or extracorporeal life support, and those who are housed in non-acute care locations in an acute care setting. I do want to point out that patients who are receiving conventional mechanical ventilation and also receiving therapies such as prone positioning, nitric oxide, heliox, or ecoprostanol are eligible to be included in surveillance. Additionally, the use of a mode of mechanical ventilation called airway pressure release ventilation or APRV can be common in some ICUs and patients on this mode are also eligible for inclusion in BAE surveillance with a caveat, which we'll talk about later. Another key term I want to cover is episode of mechanical ventilation, which is defined as a period of days during which a patient was mechanically ventilated for some portion of each consecutive day. A break in mechanical ventilation of at least one full calendar day would be necessary to start a new episode of mechanical ventilation. So if a patient is on and off a ventilator during the same calendar day, that is considered one continuous episode of mechanical ventilation. Or for example, if the patient is extubated today and reintubated tomorrow, that would still be considered one episode of mechanical ventilation as there was not a full calendar day break from ventilation. But for example, if a patient is extubated on Monday, remains off the vent all the next day on Tuesday, and then is reintubated on Wednesday, the reintubation on Wednesday would begin a new episode of mechanical ventilation since there was a full calendar day break from ventilation. Now let's take a deeper dive into VAE. But first, I do want to emphasize that the VAE algorithm is a surveillance algorithm. It is not a clinical definition and it is not intended for use in the management of patients. Just a reminder, the guidance and definitions for identifying HAIs described in Chapter 2 are not used for VAE. The VAE algorithm has three tiers. The first tier, Ventilator Associated Condition, or BAC, is a respiratory status component that identifies worsening oxygenation after a period of stability or improvement on the ventilator. The next tier, Infection-Related Ventilator-Associated Complication, or IVAC, is an, is an infection or inflammation component. And finally, the third tier provides additional evidence which indicates a possible ventilator-associated pneumonia, or PVAP. The VAE algorithm is progressive, such that the criteria for each tier must be met before moving to the next tier. In other words, a patient must first meet that criteria before you can assess for IVAC, and then the patient must meet IVAC criteria before you can assess for PVAC. However, this is not to imply that each subsequent tier is more clinically significant or worse than the one before. Each tier just provides more evidence about the ventilator-associated event. The fundamental definition within the algorithm is the VAC definition which is defined on the basis of respiratory deterioration. So even though in those circumstances where an IVAC is detected, the event still met the VAC definition. It's just that there is some additional evidence that the event may be infectious in nature as opposed to non-infectious. And when PVAP is met, there is some indication that perhaps the VAC event may be related to an infection of the lower respiratory tract. Since the BAE algorithm is progressive, let's start with the first tier and learn how to determine if there is evidence of worsening oxygenation. So how do we detect worsening oxygenation? By monitoring changes in the patient's oxygenation needs as evidenced by changes in FiO2 and PEEP settings on the ventilator. FiO2 is the fraction of oxygen which is in inspired air. For example, room air contains 21% oxygen, which can also be expressed as 0.21. PEEP is a respiratory therapy technique used to keep a patient's airway open at the end of exhalation. PEEP is expressed as centimeters of water. If 
FiO2 and PEEP settings on the ventilator are typically recorded in the paper or electronic medical record on respiratory therapy and or nursing flow sheets in the section of flow sheet that pertains to respiratory status of mechanical ventilation. Here we have a screenshot of the first tier of the algorithm that exists within the protocol. To identify a VAC, you must first identify a baseline period of stability or improvement on the ventilator in either the FiO2 or the PEEP parameter that is followed by a period of worsening oxygenation in the same parameter. But before we can do this, we must identify the daily minimum FiO2 and the daily, daily minimum PEEP for each day the patient is receiving mechanical ventilation. Once the daily minimum FiO2 and PEEP values are determined for each calendar day, then we, can, then we can assess daily minimum values for a baseline period of stability or improvement on the ventilator, followed by evidence of worsening oxygenation to determine if that is met. We've defined FiO2 and PEEP, but what do we mean by daily minimum FiO2 and daily minimum PEEP? Daily minimum FiO2 is the lowest value of FiO2 during a calendar day that is set on the ventilator and maintained for greater than one hour. Likewise, daily minimum PEEP is the lowest value of PEEP during a calendar day that is set on the ventilator and maintained for greater than one hour. For the purposes of VAE surveillance, daily minimum PEEP values of 0 to 5 centimeters of water are all equi considered equivalent to 5 centimeters of water. It's important that you have a good understanding of what these values are and how to make the daily minimum value selection, because these are the foundational elements that must be met before any other criteria are evaluated. When a patient is ventilated, the FiO2 and PEEP ventilator settings that are documented during the calendar day are what we use to identify the daily minimum FiO2 and PEEP values. By documented, we mean the FiO2 and PEEP settings that are recorded in the medical record in the section of respiratory therapy and or nursing flow sheets that pertains to respiratory status and mechanical ventilation. Remember to use a calendar day, in other words, midnight to 11.59 p.m., not some other capture period or other designated 24-hour time period. This is to ensure that data collection is consistent and comparable. Keep in mind when choosing the daily minimum FiO2 and PEEP, include all settings when the patient is on an eligible mode of ventilation. Include settings collected during weaning and mechanical ventilation liberation trials during periods when the patient is ventilated. And if patients are, are receiving excluded modes of ventilation or support intermittently throughout a calendar day, use settings documented when the patient was receiving conventional mechanical ventilation. Excluded ventilator settings that are documented during times when a patient is on an excluded form of ventilation or support, such as high frequency ventilation or ECMO, or during times when a patient is not receiving mechanical ventilator support but may have an artificial airway, such as during a T-piece trial. And here's the caveat for APRV. During periods of time when the patient is being mechanically ventilated using APRV, you will only review the FiO2 data. In instances where the patient is on one of these excluded types of support for only a portion of the calendar day, but not for the entire calendar day, daily minimum, F minimum FiO2 and PEEP values can be calculated for the portion of the calendar day when the patient is not on these excluded types of support. How do you determine the daily minimum FiO2 and daily minimum PEEP? From the eligible documented settings, you will choose the lowest FiO2 and PEEP setting during the calendar day that was maintained for greater than one hour. If there is no value that has been maintained for more than one hour, then select the lowest value, value available regardless of the period of time in which the setting was maintained. This may occur if ventilation was initiated late in the calendar day, ventilation was discontinued early in the calendar day, or ventilator settings are very unstable throughout the day. Let's look at an example. Documentation in the medical record may look something like this. 
The mode of ventilation is an eligible mode and the FiO2 and PEEP settings have been documented eight times over the course of the calendar day. When documentation of the settings takes place in intervals of greater than one hour, as in this case, it is easy to determine which values have been maintained for more than an hour. In this example, the daily minimum values for this calendar day are an FiO2 of 0.70 or 70% and a PEEP of 5 centimeters of water. When settings are documented at an hourly or less than hourly frequency, there is specific guidance in the protocol for these instances. If tracking every 15 minutes, five consecutive recordings at a certain level would be needed to meet the greater than one hour threshold. If tracking every 30 minutes, three consecutive recordings at a certain level would be needed. And if tracking every hour, two consecutive recordings at a certain level would be needed. This method of determining maintenance of a setting for greater than one hour is devised to provide standardization and ease the burden of data collection. In this example, there are periods of time when the values are documented on an hourly basis, so it is important to choose the value that was maintained for greater than one hour. Following the protocol guidance, in this example, the daily minimum FiO2 is 0.75, and the daily minimum PEEP is 8. While 0 0.70 is the lowest FiO2 value recorded for the calendar day, it was not maintained for more than one hour. At 3 a.m. it was 0 0.70, but at 4 a.m. the setting was recorded at 0 0.90. In situations when the lowest setting was not maintained for greater than one hour at any period during the calendar day, you would then select the next lowest setting that was maintained for greater than one hour as a daily minimum value. Let's look at an example where there may not be a time frame in which any value has been maintained for more than, more than an hour. Let's look at Monday on this table, which is an example of where a patient is intubated late in the calendar day. The daily minimum FiO2 would be 0.70 and the daily minimum PEEP would be 5. In the event that there is not a value maintained for greater than one hour, you will simply choose the lowest value documented on that calendar day. Now that we have reviewed the daily minimum value concept, let's make sure we have the baseline and worsening oxygenation concepts of the VAC definition fully understood. Let's re-review the elements of the VAC definition. First, a period of stability or improvement must be observed, which is defined by at least two calendar days of stable or decreasing daily minimum FiO2 or peak values. The baseline period is the two days immediately preceding the first day of worsening oxygenation. To meet the VAC definition, you must have a baseline period that is immediately followed by evidence of worsening oxygenation. This is indicated by either an increase in the daily minimum FiO2 of at least 20% or 20 points or 0 0.20 over the daily minimum of the first day of the baseline period, which is sustained for at least two calendar days, or an increase in the daily minimum PEEP of at least three centimeters of water over the daily minimum PEEP of the first day in the baseline period, which is sustained for at least two calendar days. The required increases in daily minimum FiO2 and PEEP values must be in relation to the first day of the baseline period, and the increase must be sustained at the required threshold for at least two calendar days. The daily minimum values are used to assess for both the period of stability or improvement and the period that indicates worsening oxygenation. Remember, you will not be comparing values that occur within a calendar day to determine stability or worsening in oxygenation. You are comparing daily minimum values across calendar days. The baseline period and the evidence of worsening oxygenation must occur in the same parameter. So for example, you can't have a period of stability in the FAO2 parameter and worsening oxygenation in the peak parameter and meet the back definition. 
Also, each parameter is assessed independently of the other. VAC may be met in the FAO2 parameter or in the PEEP parameter or both parameters. Baseline period of stability means that the daily minimum FIO2 or PEEP on the second day of the baseline period is equal to the daily minimum FIO2 or PEEP on the first day of the baseline period. Here we have daily minimum FIO2 values that are the same. This would be the baseline period of stability. Baseline period of improvement means that the daily minimum FIO2 or PEEP on the second day of the baseline period is less than the daily minimum FAO2 or PEEP on the first day of the baseline period. Here we have daily minimum FIO2 values that are decreasing. This would be a baseline period of improvement. This is an example of what a VAE worksheet might look like. In this example, stability can be observed in both the PEEP and the FIO2 parameters. Remember, it is not necessary to have stability or improvement in both parameters since the parameters are assessed independently. And while the establishment of stability or improvement can occur in the first two days of ventilation, the event itself cannot occur until mechanical ventilation day three or later. If you recall, the patient must be on the ventilator for more than two days to be eligible for VAE surveillance. Also, the baseline period, which is two, the two days immediately preceding the first day of worsening oxygenation, can be demonstrated by stable or improving bed settings. In this case, it is stability. So we've established that there is baseline period of stability on mechanical ventilator days two and three. In this example, there is an increase over the baseline period in the PEAT parameter of at least three centimeters of water relative to the first day in the baseline period, which is sustained for at least two calendar days, which satisfies the requirements for meeting the VAC definition. In this example, the VAC definition is met in PEEP parameter. There are at least two days of stability immediately followed by at least two days of worsening oxygenation that meets the required threshold. However, the VAC definition is not met in the FIO2 parameter. Looking at the FIO2 parameter, there was a baseline of 40 for two days, and then an increase to 60 immediately following that baseline. But the next day, the FIO2 decreased to 50, which does not meet the required threshold of an increase of at least 20 points over the first day of the baseline period. The worsening is not sustained in the FIO2 parameter and VAC is not met in the FIO2 parameter. Do note, however, that VAC is met in this case. As long as the criteria is in that in one of the parameters, the VAC definition is met. Now let's look at another case. What if an increase over the baseline period beats the requirement relative to only one baseline day? Remember, Worsening oxygenation is determined relative to the first day of the baseline period, and the baseline period is the two days immediately preceding the day of onset of worsening oxygenation. In this example, the VAC definition is not met in the PEEP parameter. While there are at least two days of improvement immediately followed by at least two days of worsening oxygenation, the required increase of at least three centimeters of water over the first day of the baseline period was not met. And another case. What if the peak value on the second day of worsening oxygenation is less than the first day of worsening oxygenation? Both days of the baseline period have a peak value of 5. The two days of worsening oxygenation both meet the criteria of at least three points above baseline, and this increase is sustained for two days. So even though the values change from 10 to 8, they still meet the criteria. In this example, the VAC definition is met in the PEEP parameter. Hopefully by now you have a good understanding of the baseline period of stability or improvement 
and finding evidence of worsening oxygenation to help you determine if a VAC has been established. Next, you'll want to know the date of event. This is defined as the date of the onset of worsening oxygenation. The earliest possible date of event is mechanical ventilation day three because you need two days of baseline period. Even though a patient is not eligible for VAE until mechanical ventilation day three, the first two days of ventilation can be used to establish the baseline period of stability or improvement. And the first possible day back criteria can be fulfilled is mechanical ventilation day four because you also need two days of worsening oxygenation. So here in the P parameter, we have the two-day baseline period of stability followed by a two-day period of worsening oxygenation. Recall from the previous slide that the date of event is the date of worsening oxygenation. In this example, mechanical ventilation day four. Why is the date of event important? The date of event is important because it will determine the VAE window period during which all criteria for other events such as IVAC and PVAP must be met. And the date of event sets the 14-day VAE event period during which another VAE may not be reported. The full 14 days must elapse before another VAE can be identified and reported. Any data collected outside the VAE window period but during this 14 days cannot be used to upgrade the VAE. And any blood cultures which may be deemed secondary to VAE must be collected during this 14 day time period. The date of this event is important in that it defines the VAE window period. So what is the VAE window period? It is a period of time during which all of the event criteria must be met. It is typically five days and includes the date of event and the two days before and the two days after. In this example, the date of event or the date of onset of worsening oxygenation is mechanical ventilation day 13. And the VAE window includes the event date the two days before, mechanical ventilation day 11 and 12, and the two days after, mechanical ventilation days 14 and 15. All other criteria used to meet IVAC and PVAC must occur during this window period. As with every rule, there is an exception. When events occur early on in the mechanical ventilation episode, specifically on mechanical ventilation day three or mechanical ventilation day four, the VAE window period may only be a three or four day window because cannot include any days before the third day of mechanical ventilation. For example, if the VAE event date is mechanical ventilation day three, then the window period includes only the date of the VAE onset and the two days after VAE onset. Because the two days before VAE onset are before the third day of mechanical ventilation. Remember, eligibility for VAE requires that a patient must be on ventilation, on mechanical ventilation for more than two days. Other than establishment of the baseline period, data from these first two days of ventilation cannot be used to meet any of the VAE definitions. In this case, the date of event is mechanical ventilation day three, and the VAE window period is shortened to three days, the day of event and the two days after. Okay, so we have a good foundation and understanding of the respiratory status component of the VAE algorithm. As we move on to the next tier, we will begin to determine if there is any evidence of an inflammatory response or infection. This is a screenshot of the second tier of the algorithm that exists within the protocol. By VAC, the patient must, be, must meet VAC and then on or after day three of mechanical ventilation, and within two calendar days before or after the date of onset of worsening oxygenation, in other words, during the VAE window period, the patient must meet both of the IVAC criteria. First, a temperature of greater than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius, or 
a WBC account of greater than or equal to 12,000 or less than or equal to 4,000 cells per cubic millimeter. And second, a new antimicrobial agent is started and continued for at least four qualifying antimicrobial days. We'll look at this more closely in the next few slides. But first, I want to remind you the VAA algorithm is progressive. There is no need to routinely gather additional information on all ventilated patients. Only if a patient meets BAC, then you would collect temperature and WBC count data. And only if a patient meets the te temperature and WBC count criteria, then you would collect antimicrobial data. To meet IVAC, meeting either the temperature parameter or the WBC count parameter is sufficient. If there are values documented during the VAE window period that meet the temperature or the WBC count parameter, they should be used to determine if the patient meets the IVAC criteria, even if abnormal temperature or WBC count values were also present prior to the VAE window period or present on admission. So back to our worksheet, where now the appropriate VAE window period is shown in pink. As you can see, we have multiple times when the temperature and WBC count criteria is met. Remember that temperature and WBC counts should only be collected once the VAC criteria have been met, because that will set the VAE window period where you, where you will look for temperature and WBC counts that meet the parameters. And now that the temperature WBC count criterion is met, you will need to determine if the antimicrobial criterion is met. The next criterion that must be met for IVAC determination is for a new antimicrobial agent to be started during the VAE window period and continue for at least four qualifying antimicrobial days. A new antimicrobial agent is one that is listed in the appendix section of the VAE protocol and which is initiated on or after day three of mechanical ventilation and in the VAE window period. The new antimicrobial agent, excuse me, the antimicrobial agent is considered new if it was not given on either of the two days prior to the current start date. So how do we figure out if four or more days of therapy have been given? We define a qualifying antimicrobial antimicrobial day, or QAD, as a day on which the patient was administered an antimicrobial agent that was determined to be new within the VAE window period. New antimicrobial agents must be continued for at least four or more consecutive qualifying antimicrobial days for the IVAC criterion to be met. Please note, if the same antimicrobial agent is administered, days between administration of the agent also count as QADs as long as there is a gap of no more than one calendar day between administrations. The requirement for four or more QADs can be met with four QADs of therapy with the same antimicrobial agent, or it can be met with four QADs of therapy with multiple antimicrobial agents, as long as each antimicrobial agent meets the definition of new. If a patient expires or for some other reason does not complete at least four QADs, they cannot meet this criterion. Okay, so let's get a visual. This is a screenshot from the VAE calculator. On here, you can see that the QADs are indicated. Please note, as long as the antimicrobial agent is new, that is, it was initiated on or after mechanical ventilation day three and in the VAE window period, the QADs can extend beyond the VAE window period. Let's look at QADs in terms of the same antimicrobial agent being administered. Days between administrations of the same antimicrobial agent count as QADs as long as there is a gap of no more than one calendar day between administrations. In this example, ceftazidine was administered on mechanical ventilation days five, seven, and nine but the days in between administrations count. So we have QADs on mechanical ventilation days five through nine for a total of five QADs, which meets the parameter. Also as shown here, as long as the antimicrobial agent was determined to be new within the VAE window period, 
the accrual of QADs can extend outside the window period. Remember, the requirement for four QADs can be met with multiple antimicrobial agents as long as each antimicrobial agent was determined to be new. However, days between administrations of different antimicrobial agents do not count as QADs. In this case, both ceftazidime and meropenem are new antimicrobial agents, but mechanical ventilation day four does not count as a QAD, so the QAD criterion is not met. The date of initiation of the antimicrobial agent is important. You can see here in the instruction from the calculator to include all days of antimicrobial administration for all days which are shown on the screen, including the days prior to and after the VAE window period, which is identified in PEACH. The calculator needs this information to be accurate in order to give the correct determination. Having the correct administration days is important because an antimicrobial agent will not meet the definition of new if it is not administered for the first time on or after the third day of mechanical ventilation and in the VAE window period. This is one of the questions that we hear from users frequently. Do you count an antimicrobial agent as new? if it is new as a result of de-escalation or simply a switch from one agent to another in the same drug class? And the answer is yes. Although we applaud and support antimicrobial stewardship activities to avoid additional substantial complexity, there are not rules or exceptions for changes that represent, for example, narrowing of spectrum or de-escalation of therapy. These kinds of situations are very difficult to operationalize in a way that is easy to implement and to standardize across facilities. To summarize, meeting the infection-related ventilator-associated complication, or IVAC definition, does not mean that the infection-related event is necessarily respiratory in origin. The IVAC antimicrobial list was refined by removing selective antimicrobial agents that would not be used or be unlikely to be used in treating a lower respiratory infection in a critically ill patient. Still, it is possible that an existing agent may have dual purposes and not necessarily be treating a respiratory infection. However, there is no need to discern the reason for the administration of the antimicrobial. Prophylaxis, de-escalation, or change within a class of microbials is not a reason for exclusion. Rules for meeting this criteria are not perfect, but we need a standardized method for assessment of antimicrobial therapy without needing knowledge of things such as dosing, renal function, or indication for therapy. At this point, we have determined the criteria for respiratory deterioration and how to evaluate for the presence of an infection or inflammation, which may be associated with a respiratory deterioration. Next, we're going to determine if there's additional evidence that the respiratory deterioration and infection may be due to a possible pneumonia. It is important to remember that this is a surveillance definition and not a clinical one, and this is not meant to be diagnostic or to guide any clinical decisions. Here's a screenshot of the third and final tier of the algorithm that exists within the protocol. Again, remember the VAE algorithm is progressive. There is no need to routinely gather additional information on all ventilated patients. Only if a patient meets BAC and meets IVAC, then you would collect laboratory data. And remember, only specimens collected on or after, on or after day three of mechanical ventilation and within the VAE window period are eligible for use in meeting PVAC criteria. Organisms identified in laboratory specimens collected outside the VAE window period cannot be added as pathogens to the VAE. There are three criteria, criteria for PVAP, which we'll be reviewing in the next, next two slides. Keep in mind, as long as one of the criteria is met, PVAP is met. Briefly, PVAP criterion one requires a positive culture from endotracheal aspirate, BAL, lung tissue, 
or protected specimen brush, which meets the quantitative or semi-quantitative thresholds outlined in the protocol. Sputum is not an acceptable specimen for meeting this criterion. If your laboratory reports semi-quantitative results, those results must correspond to the quantitative thresholds. So how do you relate your lab's semi-quantitative culture results to the quantitative thresholds in the algorithm? First, ask your lab what the corresponding semi-quantitative value is to the quantitative threshold of interest. If they do not know, then for the purposes of VA surveillance, we consider that a semi-quantitative result of moderate, many, numerous, or heavy growth, or two plus, three plus, or four plus growth to meet this criterion. This information can be found in FAQ number 24 in the VAE protocol. PDAP criterion two requires a purulent respiratory secretions definition to be met and an organism be identified from sputum, endotracheal aspirate, BAL, lung tissue, or protect specimen brush without sufficient growth to meet the quantitative or semi-quantitative thresholds in criterion one. Purulent respiratory secretions is defines, defined as at least 25 neutrophils and 10 or fewer epithelial cells per low power field. This information is typically found in the gram stain results section of the lab report. If the laboratory results for purulent respiratory secretions are reported in a format that does not meet the definition as written, first check with the lab to determine equivalent reporting criteria. If they are not able to provide guidance, you can refer to Table 2 and FAQ number 19 in the VAE protocol for guidance. This is a screenshot at Table 2. We won't go into all the details, but I wanted you to know what it looks like so you can refer, so you can refer to it if you need to. PDAP Criterion 3. This criterion can be met by one of the following positive results. Pleural fluid culture, when obtained as described, non-culture-based testing methods or long histopathology results, which indicate an abscess formation, evidence of fungal invasion, or infection with a viral pathogen, a diagnostic test for Legionella species, or a diagnostic test on respiratory secretions, which is positive for influenza, RSV, adenovirus, parainfluenza virus, rhinovirus, human metanumovirus, or coronavirus. Please note, for pathogens such as Legionella species and the selected viruses that are identified using non-culture-based diagnostic testing, they may be identified through antigen testing, PCR, direct fluorescent antibody testing, or serology. It is important to note pathogens, with the exception of the excluded pathogens, which we'll cover next, may only be reported for PVAP, but not for IVAC or VAC. Candida species are yeast not, yeast not otherwise specified, coagulase negative Staphylococcus species, and Enterococcus species, when identified from sputum, endotracheal aspirates, BAL or protective specimen brushings are not eligible for pathogen reporting for PVAP. When candida species are yeast not otherwise specified, coagulase negative staphylococcus species or enterococcus species are identified from lung tissue or pleural fluid, these organisms may be reported as PVAP pathogens. Additionally, reports of commensal florida of the oral cavity or upper respiratory tract as well as certain community-associated fungal pathogens that are listed in the protocol are excluded from reporting as pathogens. What if I have a BAL culture report similar to this? Normal flora with many Pseudomonas aeruginosa and moderate candidate species. Can I use this report to meet criterion one of the PVAP definition? And the answer is yes. 
as long as an eligible pathogen, in this case, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is identified, even if accompanied by an excluded organism, in this case, Canada, the eligible, eligible pathogen may be used to satisfy the PDAP criteria. You notice that the result for Pseudomonas aeruginosa was reported with the semi-quantitative result of many, which is an acceptable equivalent for criterion one. What if a pathogen is identified outside the VAE window period, and then later during the window period, the same pathogen is identified again? Can that pathogen be used to meet PVAP criteria? And the answer is yes. Recall that it doesn't matter if a patient has had previous positive cultures. If an eligible pathogen is recovered from an eligible specimen, which was collected during the VAE window period, it should be used for determining if PVAP criteria is met. In summary, let's look at meeting each of the PVAP criteria. In this case, VAC is met, IVAC is met, and we have a quantitative report of 10 to the fifth CFUs per mil of an eligible pathogen from an endotracheal aspirate, which satisfies PVAP criterion one. If there was not a quantitative report, but there was a report of a semi-quantitative result, for example, moderate or heavy growth was found, the PVAP definition would also have been met. Here we have an example of how PVAP criterion 2 could be met. VAC is met and IVAC is met. Additionally, the lab results show that the purulent respiratory secretions definition is met. The specimen has greater than 25 neutrophils and less than 10 epithelial cells per low per hour field. And there is a qualitative report of an eligible pathen, pathogen from an endotracheal aspirate, which did not meet the threshold for criterion one. This slide demonstrates meeting PVAP criterion three. This is less common means for meeting the PVAP definition. VAC is met, IVAC is met, and a pleural fluid culture result is going candida albicans. A report of any pathogen from pleural fluid, including candida species or yeast not otherwise specified, coagulase negative staphylococcus species, and enterococcus species, regardless of quantity, will satisfy this PVAP criteria. So now that we have defined PVAP, let's review from the VAE protocol how a BSI can be determined secondary to VAE. A secondary BSI may only be reported for PVAP and only when the following requirements are met. At least one organism from a blood culture specimen matches an organism from an appropriate respiratory tract specimen collected during the VAE window period. And the blood culture was collected within the 14 day event period. Remember, the VAE date of event or date of onset of worsening oxygenation is day one of the 14 day event period. Also keep in mind there are situations when a secondary BSI cannot be reported for PDAP. Also note that any candidate species or yeast not otherwise specified, any coagulus negative staphylococcus species, and any enterococcus species identified from blood cannot be deemed secondary to a PDAP unless the organism was also identified from a pleural fluid or lung tissue specimen that was used to meet a PVAP criterion. Additionally, second, secondary BSIs are not reported for VAC or IVAC events. Now that we've finished the BAE algorithm, there are two final terms I want to review. Location of attribution is the inpatient location where the patient was assigned on the date of the BAE or the date of onset of worsening oxygenation. And the exception to the location of attribution, the transfer rule. If a VAE date of event is on the day of transfer or the day following transfer from one inpatient location to another in the same facility or to another facility, the event is attributed to the transferring location. Let's get a visual. 
In this example, a VAE is identified in the surgical ICU with a date of event on mechanical ventilation day four. The patient was transferred from medical ICU to surgical ICU on medical, mechanical ventilation day two, which is two days prior to the VAE date of event. Since the VAE date of event is not on the day of transfer or the day before, the VAE is attributed to the surgical ICU. In this example, a VAE is also identified in the surgical ICU with a date of event on mechanical ventilation day four. The patient was transferred from medical ICU to surgical ICU on mechanical ventilation day three. Because the VAE DOE occurs on the day following transfer, the VAE is attributed to the transfer location, the medical ICU. And now for the final act. I've just provided you with an overwhelming amount of information about VAE surveillance. But the good news is that you don't have to absorb it all right now. We have plenty of resources available to supplement this training session. I encourage you to become familiar with the resources available on the NHSN VAE webpage. These materials will help you to understand how to apply the VAE protocol and to report events and denominator data. Be sure to review the supporting materials section as well as the FAQs in the protocol and on the webpage. And the training resource page includes computer-based training modules and training videos. And use the VAE calculator. The VAE calculator can, can, can assist you with case determination, as well as provide explanations about how the determinations were reached. I encourage you to experiment with the calculator. It is a great way to see the definitions in action. But remember, the calculator is only a tool. I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, garbage in, garbage out. If you enter incorrect data, the calculator will give you the wrong answer. To make the calculator work effectively for you, you must understand the VAE surveillance algorithm and the rules for entering the correct data into the calculator fields. The calculator is a great resource and complement for your VAE surveillance, but remember, it is not a substitute for you knowing and understanding the protocol. I also want to share some tips for VAE surveillance. Share the protocol with your colleagues in the respiratory ther therapy department, as well as with colleagues on the critical care staff. They can really help you understand the portions of the algorithm that have to do with the ventilator and associated therapies, and how the information is documented in the medical record. Also, your laboratory colleagues can help you understand how they report gram stains and cultures, and how those in line with the definitions in the VAE protocol. When conducting VAE surveillance in plan, remember you must report all VAEs that are identified. You cannot elect to perform surveillance for or to report only one or two events. For instance, you can't only survey for and report PVAP. You must perform surveillance for all three events, VAC, IVAC, and PVAP. All eligible patients must be assessed for VAC, and if in MET, assessed for IVAC, and if MET, assessed for PVAP. But remember the hierarchy and report only the highest level for the MET for the patient. Make sure to review the VAE event form and the table of instructions. They provide additional information necessary for data collection and reporting. Regarding denominator, remember to collect your denominator data, data at the same time each day. Collaboratory or with, collaborate with your respiratory, nursing, or IT colleagues to obtain this data. And make sure to review the denominator, denominator collection forms in the table of instructions. They also provide additional information necessary for data collection. And the final resource I can offer you. Please send any questions you may have to the NHSN Help Desk at nhsn at cdc.gov. Thank you for viewing the 2022 NHSN VAE Surveillance Training Session.